Hi, I'm sorry I'm unable to give the, the talk directly, but I'm going to try and go through it um, from here and I'll try and edit in my video slides of what's happening. Now, I'm starting off by talking about what political system does the USA have. Officially, the USA is a democracy and it has all the ceremonial and symbolism which is supposed to be associated with democracy. And there's actually a rather nice point about this. At one level, if you look at the buildings of Washington, they are white marble buildings with pillars. And your first thought is, oh, this is modelled on Athens. It's modelled on Athenian democracy. But then there are other themes within that. They have a domed capital. Now that dome is actually a piece of Roman architecture. And when you look into the history of it, you find that these great monuments were actually built by slave labour. And that the political form of the US Constitution is far more influenced by that of Rome than of ancient Athens. And that's significant because Rome was an oligarchy and more and more political scientists are coming to say that in fact the US is an oligarchy. And this is coming out in the press, it's coming out in books, it's coming out in commentary. Um, people are saying, uh, quoting a study by Gillens uh, from Princeton and Page from Northwestern, which found that the preferences of rich people almost entirely determine what laws are passed, and very little influence is exerted by middle and lower income people on, on the laws that are put forward and that policy changes with support among the economic elite are very likely to get passed, or well, get passed 50% of the time, whereas those with support among, which don't have support among the elite, are unlikely to get passed. Now, this effect on public policy is, is one thing. It is empirical evidence that the, the rich dominate the policies in America. The next point is to look at who makes up the legislature and you find it's very unrepresentative of the population. For instance, the, the richest senator was worth 500 million. Even the prominent democratic senator like uh, Feinstein was worth 58 million. And 157 members of Senate, of the, not of Senate, of Congress had, were, were millionaires and 155 members of Congress were, had fortunes between 100,000 and 1 million. Now those are not vast fortunes but if you contrast them to the situation of most Americans that is a lot. The median American household had only about $4,000 in savings and even if you count their other assets like uh, bank accounts and the uh, uh, etc. Their sorry, not just the bank accounts, but retirement savings. Their median savings was eleven thousand. So that these assets of the legislature put them way, way above the median position. Now, why are they so unrepresentative? The U.S. has got elections. So it ought to be more representative, but we know that Congress is very unrepresentative. Now this goes right back to issues that were debated more than 2,000 years ago. Aristotle, writing in the politics and the Athenian constitution, said that the two key principles of democracy were that the sovereign assembly of the citizens decides major questions and that any councils are selected by lot from the citizen body, not 
elected. He further says that states based on elections rather than lot were in fact aristocracies, not democracies. So in that sense, uh, the US would be an aristocracy or an oligarchy. And it probably was deliberately designed to be an aristocracy by the slaveholding aristocrats of the South. But the point that Aristotle makes is that if you have deliberate selection, as you get in elections, this always selects higher class people because the richer and better educated people are in a better position to campaign for office and get disproportionately represented. And the social composition of the US Senate is a clear illustration of that. And he said the distinguishing feature of a democracy was that the poor actually rule the state. Now, in ancient democracies like Athens, that was done by the body of citizens meeting in the town hall and voting on things. And the same system persisted in Switzerland till recently. Now, obviously in setting up a state like the US, which was continental in size, or at least very large, they couldn't replicate town hall democracy of the sort which existed in localities in the U US at the national level. And they so the upper class certainly didn't want that to happen. So instead of an Athenian model, they chose a Roman model. And all the key items of the US Constitution are, are pulled directly from that, the Constitution of Rome. Firstly, they call it a republic, which is a Roman term. Secondly, they have a president and vice president who correspond to the consuls in the Roman Republic. Then they have a Senate, which is drawn directly from the Roman Republic. Now, at this point, you start to get it even less democratic than the Roman Republic. Because the Roman Republic at least had an assembly of the plebs, where the non-senatorial citizens could gather in the town square and vote on things. That doesn't exist in the US Constitution. Instead, they have the Congress, which is an elected body. So they have two, two elected bodies, both of which end up being disproportionately made up of the upper classes. They even have a role for what was the priesthood or augurs who would decide on critical issues and whether they, the, the gods favoured them or not. Instead of a, a priesthood deciding whether the gods favoured them, they have the Supreme Court. But it's the same thing because the the, the Pontifex Maximus in, in Rome and the College of Priests were drawn from the senatorial or upper classes, and the same is the case of the US, US Supreme Court. Now, it may be said that there was no option in the days of when they set up the US, no option but to have an elected assembly. Well, that's partly true and partly not true. It was certainly impossible to hold votes of the entire population of the type that were held in ancient Athens or were being held in Switzerland at the time the US was set up. You couldn't do that on a continental scale. You could, I suppose, have chosen the Congress by lot, the way the council in Athens was chosen by random selection among the population. And that would have given a representative class composition. The other thing that uh, can be done now though is to use electronic voting. It is perfectly possible to have a virtual community, a virtual meeting of the entire population. Issues debated on TV People can make contributions from the, the, the population on TV by having a, an audience uh, debating it that is randomly selected. And then people can vote. And you can vote by mobile phone or the internet. Uh, I'll get onto that later. Technically, you can say that wasn't available. Now, what's happening in Britain is an example of 
the historical process by which one form of democracy or one form of rule replaces another. You all know that in the 1600s the absolute monarchy in Britain was overthrown and a parliamentary system was established um, by the victory of Cromwell's revolutionary armies. And that establishes the, the principle that in the British constitution the monarch had to obey what Parliament said. Although the fiction is maintained that the monarch is just taking the advice of her ministers. In practice, the salutary example of King Charles having his head chopped off when he didn't take the advice has meant that no other monarch has dared not take the advice. The reality, obviously, is that like the US Senate uh, the, and Congress, the two houses of Parliament in Britain are drawn from the upper classes, disproportionately drawn from the upper classes. Um, and when an issue that is particularly critical comes up, this has in the past always been dealt with in Parliament. But a crisis was caused when the issue of membership or non-membership of the EU was, instead of being settled in Parliament, put to a direct democratic vote of the population. The overwhelming majority of the Parliament and of business interests were pro-remaining in the EU. The upper class as a whole were pro-remaining in the EU. There was a minority within the political class and a minority within the business class that wanted to leave. But they were not a majority. They were therefore shocked when the direct vote said to leave. And the direct vote said to leave largely on the basis of class. The less educated you were, the lower your income was, uh, the more likely you were to vote to leave. Among university educated, skill, highly skilled people, the proportion voting to leave was much lower. Most of them voted to remain. However, it was a leave vote, but the Parliament didn't want to, to enforce it. And you went through three years of increasing constitutional crisis as you had a contradiction between direct democracy and parliamentary representation. And all sorts of arguments were put forward to the effect that the vote was just advisory, that um, the masses were ill-informed, were not in a position to make judgments on topics like this. So what was interesting to me was that these were all very old arguments. These were arguments which went right back to the um, arguments Plato made against democracy, that the masses were ignorant were led by demagogues and therefore shouldn't be trusted to vote on things. These were classic anti-democratic, classic aristocratic arguments that were being put. And they weren't just being put by the far right by any means. The paradox was that it was the liberal left that was most enthusiastic at putting these classical anti-democratic arguments forward. Now, it was a catastrophic error of the Labour Party in Britain to adopt those positions. They were able, by allying with groups of the Conservative Party in Parliament, to repeatedly block a law to remove to leave the EU, but when an election came they were completely defeated. And the populist right were the ones that gained a victory from this. Now, this issue of whether the, the system in, in the West is democratic or not isn't just being played out in Britain. It's being played out across Europe. Most obviously in France, where there have been huge demonstrations by the Yellow Vests 
against the presidency of Macron. Enormous demonstrations. Um, the, the British press plays them down. You don't hear that much about them. But these movements have been bringing up issues of classical democracy. One of the key demands they're making is that the, the people should be able to demand a referendum on any issue for which there are sufficient signatures. They're also raising the issue of whether elected parliaments should exist at all or whether citizens' assemblies chosen by lot should take their place. So these are the classic demands of democracy which are now coming to the fore again because the fraudulent character, the oligarchic character of the constitutional systems in the Western countries is becoming increasingly apparent to the public. Now, in a sense, it can be said that the parliamentary system was obviously a clear advance over absolute monarchy. It reduced the arbitrariness and allowed at least some voice for those who could vote. Those who could vote were in the main the property classes because property qualifications for voting were only removed in the 20th century, uh, but they allowed some kind of popular vote. But time and time again you come up with a situation where legislation is passed which would never have been put through if it were put to a referendum. Now, the lessons I have been drawing from this, and this is something I've been arguing since the time of Margaret Thatcher and her poll tax in, in Scotland, is that the left should be championing direct democracy. We should be calling for referenda, we should be calling for direct electronic voting on issues to do with tax and spending, and we should be calling for legislative bodies to be selected by lot. Now, there's been experiments with this recently. In Ireland, they had a citizens' assembly to decide on whether or not there should be a referendum on abortion, and the citizens' assembly said yes. There was then a referendum, and the abortion law went through, which was a tremendous setback to the established power of the church. And it would never have gone through if it was left to the ordinary parliamentary system. Now, how can you do referenda easily? Well, we developed an experimental system at Glasgow University, which we call HandyVote, which uses the most basic mobile phone facility, sending a text message. The idea is that all citizens are given or get a voting card, and they ideally they get the voting card by when they go to vote, they put their hand in a jar and pull out a sealed envelope of their choice and this has a voter's card on it, like a credit card, which has a secret number that only they know. So nobody knows who, what your secret number and what your secret PIN is because no one could predict which envelope you're going to draw out of the, the jar. So you then have that when you want to, when there is a an issue which there's going to be a referendum on, there's a television debate, there's then a vote yes or no, and you c it's done by sending a text message, Y for yes, N for no, followed by your secret number and your PIN. In order to validate that there's no cheating, the lists of all the numbers with the PINs removed that voted yes and all the numbers that voted no are published on the web. You can then check that your number was in that. Anyone with a computer can rapidly scan through millions of, of numbers. The totals can be independently verified by everyone who has a computer. The whole system is open and above board. You can see how you voted, but no one else knows how you voted because your number is secret. Um, the PIN is not published so that you can reuse your card later um, and no one else knows what your PIN is so no one else can 
just look at the, the numbers that have voted and guess the bin. So the system is simple, secure and personally verifiable. And we have also demonstrated in the software for counting votes that you can use that for voting on a combination of expenditure and tax issues. So people can vote whether they want taxes up 5%, taxes down 5%, expenditure on education up 5%, expenditure down 5%, etc. Uh, and the, the software then chooses the mean position of what people want, the average position of what people want as a change. So the point is, that's a, dem a proof of principle and a demonstration. But what it shows is a, that it's very cheap and simple with modern technology to have nationwide referenda. And it also shows that they can be on topics which are go beyond just yes or no. You can, in fact, have them on economic decisions as well.